when you, when you started out, well, you said, uh, well, you wrote six of the songs by the age of 27. Um, what, what was your initial idea when you started writing songs and about, well, having people hear your songs? What was your, sort of, what was your standard of success back then? I think when you're a kid, you, um, I, I've wanted to be a musician since I can remember. And as a kid, you don't necessarily understand it. And, and you think you want to be this sort of famous pop star and you want to sign with, you know, a major label and you want to be on top of the pops or whatever. But as I got older and as I sort of actually got into music, I realised actually what, what was really important to me, which was making music that I love and is credible and that I can be proud of. And uh, that doesn't always necessarily mean being commercially successful. And yeah. I went busking five or six years ago and I sort of met, I, I let a lot of those expectations go. I think I was just like, OK, look, I'm going busking on my own. I'm selling this little CD out of my guitar case. I'm never going to get to number one. I'm never going to have commercial success. But that's fine. And ironically, as soon as you let go of all of that shit, it starts to happen because you're not pushing it, you know? Were your songs better or your lyrics better when you let, it, let that feeling go, in hindsight? Yeah, definitely. I, I have an album called Wide Eyes Blind Love, yeah. which I made with a friend in his attic studio. It took about five days, cost no money, but I think it's, apart from this new one, Whispers, I think it's my favourite album that I've done. And it's just so fucking honest, so real. Every lyric is meant, and it's not for effect, it's not, oh, that's clever, it's just because that's how it was written and that's how it came out. So I think there was a real honesty in that album that, that Be I love. Before we go into the new album, I have one question. Um, let me see, what's his name? Do you, have you spoken to Andrew recently? Yeah, me and Andrew are, are really good mates. Andrew was... Um, Andrew and I sort of formed the band Passenger yeah. and we were songwriting partners and he produced the record and I used to babysit his kids and you know like we were super super close and um, yeah we, we're still amazingly good friends I think yeah you know the band broke up and he's doing something else musically now and, and you know I think we're really proud of what each other are doing and we're really supportive and yeah it's 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 great that we've been able to sort of remain such close friends, I think. Because why I'm asking this question, of course, because you've had many success now, much success, and he, well, obviously hasn't that commercial success. Um, did it influence the re relationship you had? Maybe he felt like, well, I, I am missing out now, or... But I think in the same way that when I went busking, I made a decision to actually shy away from trying to chase that. When he left the band, he formed an electronica, left field electronica project called Grasscut, which is phenomenal, like amazingly, brilliantly musical and clever. But it's not, you know, Amy Winehouse, it's never going to get commercial success. It, it's got critical acclaim and recognition, but I think that that's just what he wanted to do. He wanted to do that from an artistic point of view. And, you know, he's, he's a brilliant, brilliant musician, and I don't think he really craves that you know, commercial yeah. success so much. That's good. Yeah. Um, was it for you when you had that, that hit, him eh, uh, with Let It Go, was it easy to write new songs? As easy as ever, or was it, was it getting more difficult, or...? Really easy, um, partly because by the time Let It Go actually became a hit, I'd written 27 Hearts on Fire, seven or eight of, of the songs yep. on this new album already, so the pressure was off. I knew I had songs that I loved and believed in for the next album. There was no, no pressure on that. Um, and because there was no pressure, it allowed me just to keep on writing freely. Yeah. So I wrote Scare Away the Dark and Riding to New York and Whispers and all these other songs since Let Her Go has, has got big. So, yeah, I think there's two ways to look at it. You can either think, OK, I've, I've got a massive hit. I've had a massive hit. Now I need five more. Or you can say, how brilliant, I've had a hit single. One hit single in my career would be enough for me, you know, it's yeah. something I never thought would happen. What a brilliant thing to tell your grandkids. And uh, I think that's the way I look at it. And all I want now is, um, is to be able to carry on making music that I like, you know. Um, 
But the album is called Whispers. It's also a track on the album. Uh, does it mean is it a more special song? Or I love that song. I, I really do. I think that some of the lyrics in that song are the, the best I've done. Um, what? Which ones? Yeah. Which which, which lines? Uh, all I need is a whisper in a world that only shouts. I think is very simple but very sort of poignant. And can you take me to the well to the to the stage you were in when you wrote this? Yeah, I remember it really well. I, I was in the tour bus when we were touring at the start of 2013 around the UK and Europe. And uh, Let Her Go had started sort of for, for a few months, had started to sort of gain momentum. And it was a really interesting time because although I was really excited about what was happening, and the gigs were getting bigger and this song was, you know, dominoing through Europe, I was also really sort of um, a bit scared, actually, a bit sort of unsure about what it meant, you know, suddenly from being a busker and having all this freedom to, you know, an itinerary and there's interviews, there's radio, there's TV, there's structure. And, uh, and yeah, so I think looking back, I, I was writing that song because I felt like I didn't have any space in my head. Yeah. There's just, you know, the climax of the song just says everyone's filling me up with noise and I don't know what they're talking about. And you just repeat that three times and it's quite, yeah, it's quite painful to listen to in a way, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a really cathartic song to write at the time. And why did you, when did you decide to call the album this way? I don't know, I can't remember when it, when I decided on the, on the album name, but it just felt so good. Whispers just feels, I don't know, for, for a few reasons. I, I feel like a lot of my songs are quiet and quite subtle. So the idea, idea of sort of whispering to people is, is a nice one. Um, especially in a world where, you know, you're, you're up against people like, you know, big pop stars that are making a lot of noise and a lot of rackets and glossy videos. And I don't know, I, I think what I'm trying to do is a, a little bit, bit different and maybe a bit quieter and a bit more subtle sometimes. There's um, a song called Riding to New York. It's, mm. it's about a meeting that you had with a man dying of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, did he know that you wrote this song about... Okay. This guy, I met him in a, in a gas station at 3 a.m. in Minneapolis. And I spoke to him for 15 minutes and then he rode off. So there's no possible way. I, I don't know if I ever knew his name. I certainly didn't get his email or anything. So yeah. unless he happens to hear it randomly and put two and two together, but I don't know, I don't know but if how come? But how come you, 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 you talk to a guy of, well, a few minutes and he tells you his story? It was a weird situation. I, I was giving up cigarettes at the time and really craving one. I'd given up for two or three months. I was like, fuck this, I'm gonna go and get some cigarettes. Three in the morning, got out of bed, walked to this gas station. Nobody else around, complete ghost town. This one guy outside a, the gas station smoking a cigarette. And as I walked past him, he said, this is the best cigarette I've ever smoked in my life. It was the weirdest fucking thing ever. So I walked over to him and we just started chatting and I, was tell I told him what I was doing and you know, it started like that. And I asked where he was going because he had this massive bloody Harley Davidson motorbike. And he told me the story, he just kind of said, look, this is what's happened, I've been diagnosed with cancer. Um, and I'm riding it from LA to New York and I'm gonna live the rest of my life with my family in New York. It was just this, he wasn't saying it because it was a big, big moment. He was just telling me what he was doing. There wasn't any Hollywood about it. There wasn't any drama. No. It was just like, this is what I'm doing. Do you, do you need these sort of meetings with people? They for your happen. songs, for your... They happen. I mean, I don't, I don't look for them. Okay. I never sort of try and poke a sad story out of people. But when you travel, when you busk, when you are on trains, when you stay in hostels, when you are open to people and you're listening to people, when you're not just, you know, if somebody starts talking to you and you're not like, what do you want? When you're like, yeah, okay. That happens. You actually, you hear people's stories. And in the same way as a journalist or a somebody who makes documentaries or writes books or 
you have to be open to the world. You have to listen to what's going on. You said, well, yeah. busking and um, hostels. Have you changed your the lifestyle or the places that you stay now once you've hit and what people think that you get that you earn more money now than you did yeah recently so you can maybe you can afford to stay in well at a hotel yeah Do you change your 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 way of living when you busk and when you with within reason yeah i mean look when i was busking i'd spend 10 to 15 euros a night on a bed you know it would be in a dormitory with 16 other people i'd have to put my guitar under my bed and worry about it getting stolen of course, I'm not going to do that anymore. It'd be crazy. It's, it's changed, and this place is lovely. This hotel's great. And uh, when you're on the road all the time, and when you're passenger all the time, when you need to, not need to, but I, I want to give my best to people. I want to stop and chat to people and, and busk and have time for everyone. Actually, sometimes you need to come back to a nice, calm environment where you can just lock yourself away and watch Game of Thrones or have a bath or, you know, play some music and just be by yourself in a, in a nice environment, so. Have you, been to re have you been to Brighton recently? Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a flat in Brighton. Uh, that's the only thing I've spent money on, you know? Just, I, had, I didn't have a house for five years, so buying a house was an amazing feeling. And just to have a place, again, like the, a better hotel room, it, it's a place that I can go back to and be myself and be quiet and just digest everything that's happening because it's a crazy life at the moment, you know? It's really, really, it's very intense and you, you just need a bit of space sometimes. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thanks, man. Thank you. That was really cool. Yeah. Great, great questions. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thank you. I was very honest in that interview. Yeah.